in the tradition of Malcolm X, peace be unto you. I think that if Malcolm X and Dr. King were alive today, they would have been in Glasgow, Scotland to give talks and to hear what the nations of the world are planning to mitigate climate change, the effects of climate change. Because if climate change is not addressed seriously by reducing the amount of CO2 spewing into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels, we're doomed. There is no way out of this global problem for most people on Earth. I think they would have taken a strong stand. They would have spoke about the damage that is being done to uh, people of color, poor nations all over the world. And I do also believe that nothing would have resulted from it, just as is the case today. It was an utter waste of time. They could have had a Zoom meeting and did what they did, which was virtually nothing. And uh, in fact, at the same time that they were attending the meeting, Saudi Arabia is still bombing the people of Yemen and killing babies, starving women and children and men to death. And this is under the Biden administration, continuing from the Trump administration. So we skip on doing what we've been doing with our tax dollars, and that is undermining the little stability that some nations have to promote our economic interest. And when I say our, I don't mean your interest and my interest, but our tax dollars are being used for that purpose. So I have a question to ask you, because I'm not going to dig any deeper into the COP26 conference. It was a total waste of time. I didn't like seeing people from poor nations begging uh, the Western nations to help them out of the uh, situations which they are facing because the Western nations caused it. They are the primary cause of environmental degradation in what used to be called third world countries, undeveloped countries. I didn't enjoy that because it reminded me of what we do here in the United States and that is we beg uh, white supremacists for help when in fact it was white supremacists that put us in the condition that we're in. So I have a question I want to ask you. Where are you on the divided line? Uh, we've got to now get down to who we can work with versus who we cannot work with. I think most of you know who we cannot work with. But look at the divided line here. Are you on the far left or the far right? And I don't mean politically. Look at the divided line and look at the categories. On the far left, you can see that it is composed of people who engage in fantasy and imagination uh, based upon their opinions derived from their sensual experiences in the world. And as you move away from them, you move toward groups of people who are concentrated in the realm of knowledge, the realm where people master critical thinking, dialectical reasoning, another name for critical thinking, logical thinking. Which side are you on? Now there's degrees in between those two extremes, but unfortunately, I am part of a demographic in the United States which does not put a premium on learning. There's lip service that is given to learning, but the hard work that is required to upgrade uh, one's critical thinking skills, the years and years and years of reading and researching, most African-Americans, we are not willing to put that time into it, that effort into it. And so the, the, the honest truth is that most 
the majority of African Americans fall on the side of imagination and fantasy. Escapism in the cave that Plato described in his dialogue, The Republic, where we are amused by shadows on the wall. And that's just simply the way it is. Even Dr. King only got support from a very small percentage of African Americans, despite the fact that today you would think that all African Americans supported Dr. King. A very small percentage of African Americans supported Dr. King. They were involved in imagination and fantasy. And the same holds for Malcolm X, and the same holds for many other uh, men and women who sacrificed their lives to somehow make a difference in our lives. And that's the way it is. Most African Americans are not going to get on board to support the cause to better the lives of our people. And so I don't get frustrated about that anymore. I learned that when I was in college. And 90% of African Americans would not attend a BSU meeting, even though it was just a few steps away. They would not attend. They'd rather play dominoes in the cafeteria or gossip. And pretty much that's the way we are divided. So where are you on the divided line? You need to make sure that you are where you need to be if you can be there. And it takes work not to be in that fantasy category. It takes tremendous work over years to not be there. Because, you see, it's an important question, and it's important that you identify where you're at because we're in a very, very bad situation. Uh, I've mentioned to you before that if you, if you were to analyze mathematically the probability that you would even be alive. Statisticians have come up with an approximation and the chances that you would even be here listening to me right now is about 440 trillion to one. 440 trillion to one. That is the probability of being born on this planet, of you being here. Now, the situation that we're in is precarious. It's very dangerous. There's going to be events that you, you can't imagine right now how horrific they will be. And we're talking just 10 years, 20 years. Things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. Here's a headline. NASA warns global climate change impact on crops expected within 10 years. And maybe you've noticed that food prices are skyrocketing. If you go to buy a hamburger, not that you should, but if you go to buy a hamburger, it's probably twice the cost it was before the pandemic. A $5 hamburger now is selling for $10. You go to a restaurant, the cost for a dinner has doubled. So we're already beginning to see that there is an impact on crop cultivation. I told you many years ago in a talk that I did that all of our basic staples depend upon a range of temperatures beyond which on either extreme they start to diminish in terms of cultivation and yield. We're there now and it's just going to increase. There's going to be less and less and less over the next three, five, and ten years. And then it's going to get worse when we go into the 2030s because of drought. And there's going to be less water. And we've been discussing that all summer. So agriculture is going to take a nosedive all over the world as the conditions that support it become less and less conducive to cultivation of our basic crops. Now, it just so happens that for the last 8,000 years, the reason the population on our planet has grown 
to the extent that it has is because of the agricultural boom, which was directly the result of a warming period that we've been living in since the end of the last ice age. And you can see on this graph, you can see how our population, the human population, has mushroomed. Going back from 1750 up to the present day, you can see what is called an S-curve. And it's a very important curve. You don't have to know math to get this. Just look at the picture. It describes an S-curve. And it begs the question, have we reached our limit of growth? Have we reached the carrying capacity of the planet Earth? Can the Earth sustain much more? Especially given that we are polluting it in so many different ways that sea level is going to rise and other diseases are going to plague us just as COVID-19 did for the la has done and is doing for the last two years. Now, there's a mathematical way that you can calculate the carrying capacity of our planet. If you look here, you can see this is the 1.1% growth rate of the global human population. Now, presently, it states on this that we are at 7.9 billion people. I think you can increase that up to 8 billion and you'd be just fine. So the rate of growth is 1.1% per year. And here's the formula which is used to calculate the carrying capacity of our planet or of any environment. Because once the resources begin to decline, there's less to provide for the people to live their lives, to increase their numbers. And that's what we're faced with. And that's why I talked first about crop failure, about decreased yields with regard to the basic staples that we need, that we depend on, that we've been depending upon since the beginning of the agricultural period, 8,000 or so years ago. Now, once we reach that point where the environment cannot provide for us the resources that we need, population starts to peel over, and that's where the S-curve comes in. That S curve that you saw will start to go down, slope down, and that's where we're headed. And the math, as I st said, can be done. I calculated it using that formula and came up with a limit of 11 billion human beings, a little bit more. It could be 12 billion. But it's going to be somewhere around that figure, approximately 11 billion or so people by 2050. Now, do you really think, given what we're facing, that the planet, the resources on this planet, will be such that they can be sustained, given increasing problems due to climate change? The answer is no. There's not going to be enough water for everybody on Earth, fresh water, to drink. Maybe one out of three or one out of four people will have water. And that means three people are going to die. And there's going to be places on this planet that become uninhabitable due to high humidity and high dry heat, especially in, the, in Asia, in coastal areas in Asia, in India, Malaysia, Vietnam, there's going to be massive die-offs of animals and human beings due to high humidity along the coasts of those areas. And so there's going to be billions of people who die. In fact, projections have been made that climate change could bring near unlivable conditions for 3 billion people. Now, those are scientists saying that not people who are reading scripts on the news. And you, 
usually will not hear about the scientific reports that are being churned out almost monthly. And so we're facing problems. And, and it, it means that African Americans and poor people in general, homeless people, are going to be experiencing more problems in the United States. And yes, there's going to be massive dying in the United States. Well, we just, we're going through that now. Over 600,000 Americans have died due to COVID within the last year and a half. And about 16% of those who have died have been African American. And of course, there's been a significant percentage of Native Americans and Latinos who have died as well. And there's a lot of social reasons for their increased death rates, but they've died in direct relation to COVID-19, which means when we have these types of disasters, you can expect those three groups of people are going to die first and they're going to die most because they lack resources under normal conditions, which do not prevail anymore. And we're not ready. The human race is not ready. The chances that Homo sapiens will become extinct are far greater than the chance that Homo sapiens will exist another moment. That's always been the case on this planet. There are so many reasons, so many more reasons for us to become extinct than to survive. We're lucky. We're just simply lucky because at the end of the day, we're gonna get hit and we're being hit now, but we're gonna be hit even, even more. And my concern is, of course, that we're just simply not ready. Now, let's bring it home. Make it a little bit more down to earth here so that you know this is not something that we're going to escape. There was an article that was just published October 27th, last week, called Pediatric News. And I want to just give you some of the highlights from that report having to do with the death rate in the United States. We'll begin with Ohio. The lead title here is Ohio records more deaths than births for the first time. First time. More deaths than births. More people died in a year than babies born. So Ohio recorded more deaths than births for the first time in history last year with about 10,000 more people dying than were born. In 2020, around 143,661 Ohioans died and 129,313 Ohioans were born, according to the Columbus Dispatch. Now, the trend appears to have continued so far this year. So it's happening again with 107,462 deaths and 100,781 births reported to date. So this is the second year it's happening. Deaths have not surpassed births in the 112 year period since the state began compiling data in 1909. Now let's move on here. What's going on? It says Ohio's birth rate fell by 4% in 2020. But also there's Alabama. Alabama also recorded more deaths than births for the first time last year, according to the New York Times. The state reported 64,714 deaths and 57,641 births in 2020. Now, wait a minute. You think it's only two states. Well, if you're thinking that, you're wrong because other states are having more deaths than births as well. In fact, it states about half of the United States reported death rates higher than birth rates in 2020. In 2020, the United States reported a record of nearly 3.4 million deaths, which was 18% more than 2019. 
The surplus of births over deaths added 229,000 people to the U.S. population in 2020 as compared to 892,000 in 2019, which means the country's population growth slowed last year. You're going to see an increasing slowing of the population growth rate in the United States. And that is proven by the drop in the fertility rate. The U.S. fertility rate now may be around 1.6. The African-American fertility rate is about 1.6. It dropped from what it was two years ago, about 1.7. African-American women are not having many babies anymore. And what that means is that the population is dwindling. No babies, no life. No generation means death, eventually. Deaths will likely exceed births again in many states in 2021, the article goes on to say. How large or protracted these fertility declines and mortality increases will remain to be seen, but they have already dramatically, dramatically reduced population growth in the United States. I hope you get the point. The United States of America is crumbling on so many levels. And generally what that is called is entropy. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. It's unavoidable, nothing escapes it, and it's not just the United States that's in decline. All the European nations are in decline, and even those continents like Africa that are still having a larger fertility rate are going to suffer greater deaths as climate change and the conditions that are caused by climate change takes a toll on human life. We have crossed the climate change threshold, an article you can see in the Scientific American here, and there's no going back. There's no going back. What I'm concerned about, really, is that the COP26 meeting, which just adjourned, was not intended to succeed in mitigating climate change damage. I think that the powerful global elite have decided to let it go, let it roll. You know the old saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. They may see an opportunity to let nature take its course, even though they are the cause of it. Because if the planetary population is reduced by half, which is projected to occur by 2050, then that means that those resources will be available for them. But of course, that's a very simplistic analysis on their part because of the high likelihood that one pandemic after the next is going to plague humanity and it's going to kill them too. So not a lot of things nice to talk about, but that's the way it is. And on the divided line, you should not be afraid if you're on that right side of the divided line where you do the thinking, do the research, do the reading, and prepare yourselves for what is happening and more of it that will happen in your lifetime. I am Dr. Stephen Nur Ahmed. Peace be unto you.